Hi, everyone, and welcome to, oh, hello, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to the Geothermal Lithium Extraction Prize Industry Advisory Panel webinar. We're here today with Alex Priestishev from the Department of Energy's Geothermal Technologies Office, as well as three of our IAP members, Derek Benson from Energy Source, Dan Hoyer from Vizade and Associates, and Jonathan Weisskull from Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Thank you so much for joining us for this discussion today, and I'll hand it over to Alex. Thanks, Katie, and, and welcome everybody. This is the first of our two webinars for the Geothermal uh, Lithium Extraction Prize that we'll be holding, and today we have uh, three of our uh, selected IAP members, our industry panel, our industry advisory panel members. And how about we start with a few introductions so you all get to know who are on the panel. Um, I think we'll let's go ahead and start with the top of my list uh, on the on the webinar. That is uh, Derek. You want to give a little bit of brief introduction of who you are? Sure. Thanks, Alex. So I am Derek Benson. I am Chief Operating Officer for Energy Source Minerals. Um, I have kind of a background um, for a number of years now in uh, in power uh, development operations um, and been working in geothermal for uh, I guess a little over ten years. Um, and as it relates to the to the group and the and the topic here today, I, I generally sit kind of in in between our technical teams and sort of our project finance efforts. Um, so that's sort of my my role is maybe chief translator between the uh, between the two two groups. So thank you. Thanks, Derek. How about you, Dan? We'll go to you next. I'm uh, Dr. Dan Hoyer. I've been working in the salt in the geothermal business, power generation and drilling and project management for probably 43 or 44 years and have been uh, really got to be in Salton Sea when we were still in a pilot plant and getting ready to build the first commercial plant um, for Unical. And I've been very interested in mineral recovery ever since I uh, started working on there. So glad to be part of the panel. Thanks, Dan. And you know, one question I didn't ask for you, Derek, is are you primarily focusing in the Salton Sea, the work that you do? Yeah, so so Energy Source Minerals has its project development effort is, is focused on the Salton Sea. Um, we do have um, a technology platform that we are engaged uh, more globally on uh, other uh, lithium resources, but our uh, primary uh, development effort is is at the Salton Sea in California. Okay, thanks, Derek. And then Jonathan, I'll turn it over to you. Well, good morning. Let's see. Am I on? Yes, here we are. Yeah, yep. Jonathan Weisskopf, <laughs> Vice President of Government Relations for Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Um, uh, I joined the company, uh, goodness, back in 19, in the 20th century, 1992. There were about 12 of us. Uh, we were nothing but a geothermal company at the time called California Energy Company and changed it to Cal Energy. We've grown a lot. We were uh, purchased by Berkshire Hathaway in 2000, so we're now a very large $125 billion energy company with gas pipelines, utilities, and the like. But um, I will have to tell you the geothermal side is still my first love. We've got uh, 10 geothermal plants at the Salton Sea. Uh, many have been going for 35 plus years. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law School, where I've been teaching since 1990 and active in a number of NGOs. My background um, is not uh, in science or engineering or chemistry as such. Uh, my training as a lawyer, uh, I do have a strong technical team at Cal Energy I consult with so that I guess a little bit like Derek, I can do some translating generally from engineering into English and dealing with um, the various government agencies, uh, regulatory, legislative, and the like that that have an interest in in geothermal. Uh, we're obviously looking at you know de-risking our project. Well, we'll get into that, Alex. I'll, I guess we'll talk about where we are with our various projects. But that that's a little background about myself. Oh, perfect. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. And that, that leads us into what we want to sort of talk about today with with this panel is. A little bit of an introduction of what geothermal is, what um, is going on in, in the Salton Sea, what is the Salton Sea, and just give everybody a general idea of the basis for, for this prize. 
So uh, Jonathan, you, you mentioned, you know, talking about a little bit of background, but let's let's back up first a little bit. And let's how about um, somebody sort of help us define what a geothermal brine is? Anybody has a good general definition for that? Dan, so I, yeah, <laughs> so so we use the term brine and it, usually it's uh, hot. Uh, under pressure and in a geological aquifer of one or one type or another. The Salton Sea specifically is on the San Andreas Fault and is uh, seismically active. And the brine has come um, from, you know, is old brine. Um, it has some recharge to it as well. I think. The hottest well is around 300 degrees C. I think there's a couple that were hotter than that. It has about 220,000 parts per million of uh, TDS. And so one of the key uh, issues that we deal with is, is scaling. It, it wants to go, once you bring it to the surface and you turn it into steam and water, the percentage increase in TDS is quite high and it causes it to scale. And so we use a, 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 a what's called a crystallizer clarifier system where we introduce silica we, it, it, before one of the flashes and that this scale will try to adhere to the silica because it's so much higher in, in, in density than, than the steel walls are. And so therefore, you, you, then you take it to a clarifier where that silica is settled out and, um, you, and then you inject the water back into the reservoir to reheat. Um, so I think probably the key in this is it's not very stable. And, and so one of the you know, focus areas, I think, when we talk about lithium recovery is how do you do that in this brine in that system um, and, and, and try to keep it from having both scale that is hazardous, uh, which, which right now it is not, and or lithium that has contaminants in it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll jump in uh, as, as the non-scientist, but I want Dan and Derek to correct me. But what we've got at Cal Energy, we, we do have about 23 production wells um, they range from about half a mile to more than a mile deep. The brine we bring up, it's got very temperatures, but Dan, I think some of ours are actually as high as 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And the, what, what comes up is, is, you know, roughly, well, it's about 25% this, this brine, this saline solution of dissolved minerals and metals. So we've got iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, manganese, magnesium, uh, zinc, boron, and of course lithium at only about 250 parts per million, but obviously we bring up a whole lot of it. Um, I kind of think as geothermal myself, I've tried to describe it to laymen as kind of a pot on a low boil, if you will. I mean, we've got this wonderful resource. It's at a very high temperature when the when the, um, at, at, at 500 degrees, obviously the brine reaches the earth's surface, it expands, it flashes immediately into steam, that spins the turbines that generate the electricity, and then the unused brine is returned to the geothermal reservoir through our 21 injection wells to essentially sustain the renewable energy resource so it can be used again. So in the 35 plus years, that we've been producing geothermal power from those wells, uh, we have not seen any decline in pressure in that large geothermal reservoir. Hence, the notion of kind of that pot on a low boil. Um, you know, you don't, you you do have to manage your resource. And uh, and 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 by the way, for those listening, this is not geothermal power like you may have heard about at the geysers in Northern California. That's all steam. What we've got at the Salton Sea, as Dan said, it's much more complicated. It's unstable uh, because of all the, especially the the iron, uh, the corrosion problem is immense. We have to line our wells, and Derek, I'm guessing you do, with, with titanium. I mean, it's incredibly mm -hmm. 
expensive. The corrosion problem is 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 really a very big one. But that's a little bit of a background of, of how it works. And I guess the one statistic that I throw out to folks is that lithium, yes, it's only 250 parts per million, but we're processing 50,000 gallons a minute of this geothermal brine. So if you do the math, theoretically, that could translate into something like 90,000 tons of lithium per year, which would, you know, is is very significant. I mean, a world market today of 300,000, but that's that's where the brine fits in. Uh, Dan and Derek, I've probably made 12 mistakes there, so please correct me. No, I I, I think you're fine. You know, we we bounce around between uh, metric and uh, and and standard units all the time, and uh, sometimes it uh, gets lost in, in translation. But I think we're good there, Jonathan. So. Um, well, I did learn that regular ton is 2,000 pounds, metric ton 2,200 <laughs> yes, pounds. So that is when we talk true. about, but I guess yeah. you're right. The industry does talk about metric tons. Thanks very much. No, so the only the only thing I think I'd add to to what Dan and, and uh, Jonathan have said, I think in terms of when we think about geothermal brines and you think about um, lithium from the current um, solars, and I guess I just add a little bit of a compare and a contrast. Um, because at the end of the day, um, the geothermal brines are hot, and and initially that is, um, a, I wouldn't call it a problem. You know, it's a, it's an opportunity, but it's a challenge. Um, to what Dan was talking about, you know, these scaling um, elements, and typically we're talking about um, transition metals, and we're talking about silica. And that's really maybe the highlighted difference between the chemistry of a geothermal brine and the chemistry of, say, a solar brine. The 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 flip side of that coin is uh, if you can manage those um, issues, the advantage of a geothermal brine is it's it's inherently hot. And so from a process and from the kinetics that happen downstream and, and recovery of lithium, you have something that's already hot. And that gives you an advantage when you're doing some of these uh, recovery processes. So, um, you know, as we've looked at things, you know, the, the challenge is how to, quote, maybe normalize the geothermal brine um, and get it to what is something the industry has familiarity with in terms of processing. So, um, you know, that uh, I think highlights um, what I'd say maybe it's just the, the, the final um, differences between what people think of as lithium bearing brines and geothermal brines. And you know, Derek, I think you've identified really certainly two of the, the salient differences between salt and sea geothermal brine and others. Number one, very high temperatures. And number two, very high silica content. Uh, the first being an advantage that you outlined, uh, the second being um, something you've got to deal with. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, from the last part of that is, you know, like there's, there's geothermal brines in Europe and, and they're like in the hundred thousand parts per million versus the 200, 2,500, 250,000 parts per million. So a significant difference there. And also their concentration is probably a, a third or two thirds of what it is at the salt and sea. So in, in my understanding the salt and sea is one of the more more concentrated brines in lithium yeah perfect that, that was going to be my next question on on why are why are you all looking at producing lithium from these geothermal brines it's complicated you have a big soup of a mess of a brine and and looking at all of these things that are flashing out during the power production phase um so i guess generally why are the three of you looking at extracting lithium from these brines? And I think that sort of leads into sort of, you know, going to Jonathan, what you were touching on a little bit is the state of the industry, but what makes the salt and sea brine so attractive for lithium extraction? Well, I think, I mean, you know, the, 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 there's a heck of a lot of it. That's the, that's the obvious answer, but it's really a little bit more complicated than that. Um, geothermal power by itself is not competitive right now in the market. Uh, wind and solar, I mean, as a company, we have put billions in developing wind and solar resources around the country. We have not been able to grow our geothermal 
part of our company simply because geothermal power is priced much higher than wind and solar. Part of the reasons we've already talked about all that scaling, the corrosion um, and the workforce. Uh, so, I mean, geothermal generally is priced around, you know, seven, eight cents a kilowatt hour. There's wind and solar are two, three cents. So for us, part of the attraction of the lithium production is as a bolt on technology or really a secondary stream of income that could make geothermal power uh, more competitive in the marketplace. So that's one factor. But the other is simply the potential value of the lithium by itself. Uh, the, we, we know generally that um, lithium is going to, lithium demand is going to increase as much as fivefold, if not tenfold by the end of the decade. I just sent you an article, Alex, predicting lithium prices will triple by 2030. I don't think that's going to happen, but you know, they're they're going up and and demand is going to exceed supply in just a couple of years. And when you look at the drivers, primarily primarily electric vehicles, but you know, tablets, telephones, we all know, I mean, the lithium ion batteries just absolutely essential. Um, it it's it's silly not to do it. Now, full disclosure, 21 years ago, we tried as a company to recover zinc from our geothermal brine, mm -hmm. and we fell flat on our faces. Uh, now, largely it was because the zinc market collapsed, but it was also, we kind of ran before we walked. We really pushed forward at a very rapid pace, and we, we learned a lot of lessons. But one of the lessons we learned is we did learn how to handle that geothermal brine and how to precipitate out uh, you know, the necessary metals, how to deal with the transition metals that we did not want to have precipitate out. But primarily, I mean, the, the, the short answer to your question is the market is there and there is no domestic supply of lithium in the U.S. to speak of, except for one small plant in Nevada. Uh, and I guess also, and it's not that it's not that we as companies have to be concerned with this, but as citizens of the world, the fact of the matter is the way lithium is produced in other parts of the world the environmental degradation is pretty serious. Derek made reference to these solatas, these, these salt flats in South America, these evaporation ponds, some of which are half the size of San Francisco. The water use is gigantic, and we're talking about the Atacama Desert in Chile, Argentina, which is one of the driest places on Earth. So the environmental problems there are quite serious. We anticipate, and Derek could answer better than I, using almost 90% less water than is used in the South American process. And then the other major source of lithium is from hard rock mining, you know, open pit mining in, in Australia. Again, the environmental degradation is staggering. So what we as companies can provide at the Salt and Sea is really closed loop technology based on, you know, we've got our 23 wells. We really are looking at a bolt on technology with minimal environmental impact. So lots of factors to, to answer your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. John, I want to go back to the environmental piece a little bit later, but Derek, I wanted to ask you sort of the similar question. Um, as, as far as I know that you're, you work for a company that's currently producing geothermal energy in the Salton Sea, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about why it's important to extract lithium as well from these geothermal brines. Yeah, honestly, yeah, Alex, I don't think I'm going to add much more than what Jonathan said, <laughs> other than, uh, you know, it is it is a um, a profitable enterprise on its own. And so, uh, you know, it justifies the economic uh, development, uh, you know, costs to uh, to get these projects going. So, you know, it it has um, some unique process elements. But when you have, uh, you know, at Cal Energy, you know, at the Featherstone plant, um, where we're doing our um, lithium project, you know, attached to that power plant, um, the the existing infrastructure is something you obviously leverage, and so the well fields are in place, the the uh, power lines, the workforce, the roads, those kind of things are there, and so you're you and you have a very good understanding of the resource in play and so when you talk about projects have um you know maybe three big elements one is resource risk technology risk and market risk uh when you attach to an existing geothermal plant you've 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 effectively 
known and quantified the resource. And, you know, in our case, that resource has been running for, oh, we're going on nine years now. Um, and in case of Cal Energy, they've been running much longer. So, you know, you have a very good appreciation there. And so you, you're focusing on, you know, project execution. And here, as, as Jonathan points out, the lithium market's very strong. And, you know, all indications are that, you know, the trajectory we're on is, is just beginning. So, you know, lithium from a, from a geothermal brine makes sense, particularly when you layer in um, the the market in that, you know, this is a domestic resource with low uh, country risk and, and the environmental attributes. So. Yeah, that's something I was going to, the next question I was going to ask about is how does the work that you're all doing in the salt and sea lead into this overall question of supply chain? Why is it such an advantageous thing right now to be focusing on on this on particularly lithium for domestic supply chain well i think you know just to just to weigh in i think there's maybe the recent history taught i think every supply chain that there's a difference between kind of the lowest cost supply chain and the one that's the most resilient and whether it was you know a trade spat between the us and china whether it was um, a COVID pandemic, or whether it's just, you know, the global climate change and, and recognizing that there are risks associated with, you know, offshoring all of your production. All of those, I think, have come together for a number of industries to highlight, maybe we do need to look at a, a more diversified um, supply chain. Lithium, battery components, EVs, broadly, uh, are no different and maybe to some degree more critical to think about uh, just because of the importance of you know the energy transition that's happening um, you know you don't necessarily want to repeat you know where we where we were with oil decades ago you know to have the same issues crop up with you know EV supply chain 10 years from now so I think that's it's been a, uh, a, a quick uh, evaluation, I guess, in terms of supply chain, you know, revisits just because of what has happened in the, in the recent, you know, the last couple of years. So. Well, I, I would add to that is, is um, not only is it supply chain and, you know, do, can you get, can it be disrupted, but also, you know, when you think about a supply chain that has a high CO2 imprint and that environmental piece of it is not just regulated or uh, done in China, or or it it has the potential to uh, impact the world. It, it, the other thing I would add, why salt and sea, is if you kind of go continue down that line of thinking, is that there is so much lithium at the surface at the salt and sea, <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's that access to supply. That's just, just it, you know, doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. And that's, you know, like like Derek said, and you have most of the in infrastructure around you to to access that supply. So it's it's a matter of being successful at taking the lithium out uh, in a, in a way that makes economic sense. I may be a little bit uh, more blunt. Uh, I agree with all what 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 Dan and Derek have said. Uh, let's be honest, there is a global battery race going on right now worldwide, and China is eating our lunch. I mean, we are losing. And to develop a domestic source of lithium, I think, could be the best way to jumpstart a lithium battery economy in this country. We've got some of the supply chain, but look, this is a national security issue as well as a market issue. And and I think that's really where where the supply chain point, you know, comes in. Now, putting that to one side, can the development, you know, of lithium at the salt and sea lead to, you know, cathode anode manufacturers, EV manufacturers coming down to the salt and sea? I have no idea. That's, you know, Derek and I are going to have enough trouble making making making, you know, making a profit on 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 just getting the raw material. But there's no question that having a domestic supply of that raw material uh, is going to go a long way uh, towards helping the supply chain. Now, if the result of all of this is that 
Derek's company and our company end up shipping our lithium overseas to Japan and Korea and Vietnam and China to manufacture batteries and cells, we probably haven't accomplished all that much. Uh, but I think we're we're hopeful that that the supply chain uh, will develop and and having that domestic source is unquestionably uh, an important part of that process. Thank you all. No, I think those are really excellent points and we really wanted to highlight why we're focusing so much on the Salton Sea and why it's important. And I think you all covered that point really well. Um, something that, you know, Derek, you mentioned and Jonathan a little bit uh, and, and Dan on the environmental side of things. We want to maybe talk about a little bit about um, why why is it so much more environmentally friendly to look at geothermal brines for lithium extraction than maybe your traditional evaporative ponds that they, they do down in, in Chile or some of the hard rock mining operations that are done throughout the world for lithium extraction? Why is this potentially a, a much better a way of extracting that lithium, environmentally friendly way to extract lithium. Yeah, so I, maybe I'll field it first and and uh, give you a sense. I mean, there's a there's a number of things. One is when you look at um, you know a, a solar that is utilizing pond technology. Um, the first um, issue is land use, and it's a tremendous amount of land use. Uh, but second, those ponds are while technically being driven by solar power um, in terms of the evaporative process, they're losing all of that water from, from the system. And so that is that is becoming a key issue for both the local projects, but also from um, the supply chain, you know, in terms of consumers are becoming more conscientious of where their, you know, resources are coming from and what the environmental attributes are. And water loss in those ponds is, is a big factor. Um, the, the reason geothermal brines are uh, more advantageous um, and, and and I'll speak maybe a little bit to the technology that we are deploying, um, geothermal brines obviously have a small footprint. Our site is nominally, you know, 30 something acres um, for the geothermal power plant and about the same for a minerals recovery plant. So that's a very compact footprint. You're relying on um, the geothermal wells, which have, you know, a tremendous amount of flow and a tremendous amount of, of energy in a very small footprint. Um, so that's, you know, that's very helpful. When we look at um, then the processing techniques for uh, lithium recovery, um, so we have a selective lithium extraction uh, technology platform that is uh, unique to energy source minerals, but it's the same um, um, attributes, I guess, with respect to geothermal. It is hot fluid. And so um, our process, we have a very small um, adsorbent inventory that's that's inherent to our, what we call ILIAD is, is the technology platform. And that's just short for integrated lithium adsorption desorption. But it's it's one of, you know, broad class of technologies uh, adsorption desorption, where you you take that lithium uh, bearing fluid, pass it over your adsorbent, and and preferentially pull the lithium from it. Um, from our standpoint, um, those techniques are, um, you know, state of the industry today. I guess is you know it's in its it's in its infancy, um, but they have been deployed for years, for decades, really. Um, but but what we've done is is try to do a you know a big step change in terms of the efficiency. But you know, without getting into you know a big marketing effort on on what we're doing, the the benefit though is that you you and you leverage the inherent heat of that that fluid, and then you with heat exchangers and other components, um, you're able to make your system more efficient. And then when you when you have, and this is what all the brines go through, you you ultimately work with a lithium chloride solution, and that whether it's a solar, a petrobrine, or a geothermal brine, that lithium chloride solution is then what is ultimately converted in either into a lithium carbonate or into a lithium hydroxide. And so when you look at geothermal fluids, the the ability to use both geothermal steam from the adjacent facility or hot water. 
um, when you get into your detail engineering and your design, you can do a lot of heat recovery and heat exchangers and make that system very efficient. Um, so you're not having to put a lot of heat into the system, it's already there. And then when you look at the water balance, and this is something Jonathan talked about, you know, you, you are utilizing geothermal fluids um, with a significant amount in engineering, you can recover a lot of those waters and ultimately put it all back into the resource so that you maintain the, the renewableness of the geothermal um, you know, uh, resource as well. So all in all, we ultimately commissioned a life cycle analysis by an independent party just to verify what we believe were these claims and had them do that independent work. And I think at the end of the day, you see that that geothermal um, from an energy input um, and water use are, are, are going to be head and shoulders above some of the other resources. Great. Thanks, yeah. Derek. That was a really good yeah, explanation. Not, not, not too much to add, but just a couple of little points. One, let's talk, by the way, about not just the heat source, but let's talk about the power source to run your operations because you need electricity. We'll be using renewable energy. We'll be using mm -hmm. geothermal power. In fact, we're our plans, our, our management plans are to reserve one of our plants upwards of 50 megawatts to provide that electricity. Um, back to the open pit mining in, in Australia briefly, uh, you know, obviously leaves huge scars in the landscape. Um, the physical footprint is gigantic, permanently reshaping the environment. Uh, releases about 15 tons of carbon dioxide for every ton of lithium mined. And then the rock is shipped overseas, mostly to China, for further processing. And the rock itself only contains about 5% lithium, so a lot is discarded. Mm. Uh, Derek has covered the solars in South America. The statistics I've seen are a requirement of about 500,000 gallons of water per ton of lithium, which is huge. We're projecting about 90% less, but again, huge, gigantic physical footprint and a severe impact, not just on groundwater, not just on land subsistence and the desert ecosystem, but also these ponds expose the lithium and other chemicals directly to the wind, uh, potentially in the weather, potentially impacting air quality, Residual salt waste can be toxic to flora and fauna and the like. Now, what are we doing? What is Energy Source doing? Again, essentially a closed loop system, a bolt on technology to existing geothermal plants. So a very small, minimal, minimal footprint, much less uh, water use and renewable energy to provide the electricity. And Derek's point about ESG is very important. I, I was listening into a Benchmark Minerals conference last month, and both BMW and Volkswagen uh, were talking about tremendous pressure, uh, more really in Europe than in the United States, on the sourcing of materials for electric vehicles. So I think that the environmental, the, the environmental degradation that we're seeing with lithium production in the rest of the world is I think going to have a, a, a could it well have a major market factor? Great. No, those are all really good points to be made about the geothermal. Um, I want to go back to something that we sort of touched upon a little bit um, initially, and it kind of ties into the environmental component here of um, mentioning, Jonathan, you know, that these brines are not just hot water with lithium in there. They're full of a lot of other things. And so I'm curious, and I want to hear from all of you on, on how do you think, maybe talk a little bit about um, some of the, the issues that you have surrounding um, the other minerals that seem to flash out of the system and, and provide that scaling, but also where could there be potential opportunities for not only the teams that are, are working on, on this prize, but um, uh, broadly, where could there be some areas that not only that you need help with removing scale from your process, but looking to make uh, um, some some of that scaling economical? Is there any opportunity there for those teams to do that, whether it's silica or manganese or other sort of potential um, minerals or that tie into environmental component that would 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 be a benefit? 
I'll, 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 I'll jump in there. I mean, uh, we did try zinc 20 years ago, so if somebody's got a better mousetrap, you know, let us know. Uh, but that was a different technology also. That was Electra winning. The fact of the matter is, um, you know, you've got to create a business case and a value proposition for each mineral. So, yes, there certainly is the potential. I would say zinc and manganese would probably be the others for which there might be an opportunity. I, I, I might say potassium or potash, but there's just so much of that in the world. I don't think that's the case. Uh, so I do think that, that you'd have to make that value proposition for, for each one. Um, but let me, let me ask. Yeah, let me, maybe I should rephrase the question of what are the other things within the brine that are falling out ca causing scaling that create a big problem for the process overall that could use a solution, I guess, broadly. Yes, there's maybe a market for other minerals, but like the silica market is, is, are there things that are causing big problems, not only with, with the process, but maybe potentially environmentally of having these massive stockpiles of just waste sitting around that could use some R&D efforts put towards to solve it. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, in the operations, you spend, you know, it's almost like a chemistry kit and you spend a lot of time and energy to make sure that you you produce uh, non-hazardous waste because the difference between yes. that and not with any radioactivity and, and it, that's a huge place. But I, I guess my, where, what I um, am real interested in is right now there's kind of two thoughts about do we need to take all of the solids out of solution before we try to recover lithium a chase around and or can we find a resin that will allow us to recover lithium and not uh, precipitate other other materials and and I think you know, if you want the second one for sure, it might be a harder ask to try to get that kind of molecular sieve, but, but uh, sieve out there. So, I, you know, as far as other, I, I think the the uh, crystallizer clarifier is a pretty good system, and and we are been, we've been able we do produce solids. It's this colored silica so when you put it into concrete you get green concrete <laughs> and that's not very uh, people don't like that very much nobody wants green concrete okay Thanks, well, let me jump in i have one one suggestion for those who are listening um i mean as as derek outlined i mean you know well what are, well let me back up we have two r d grants right now we've got one from the energy california energy commission simply to show that we can actually you know recover that lithium from the geothermal brine. There's a lot of pre-processing engineering. I think Derek outlined that pretty well. Um, and then we're gonna use an ion exchange technology to produce what will be lithium chloride. Now, step two, that's not the final feedstock for a lithium ion battery. Step two is to convert that lithium chloride into either lithium carbonate or, or lithium hydroxide. Um, that's where we got a second grant from the Department of Energy to build a demonstration project to do that. And we intend to use an electrolysis process there. Um, there is an issue there on membrane research and development in that conversion process. And uh, there could be some, you know, R&D efforts there. Uh, if, if, if folks are looking for ideas, uh, but that's, 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 that's one area that I, that I can think of for, uh, for others to look at. As far as the first part, it's really a lot of process engineering, lots of tanks, lots of pipes, simply to keep those, those other minerals, those other metals suspended so that we can get them back down our injection wells after we pull out the lithium. That next step, the ion, the ion exchange technology, I don't think there's a lot of rocket science there. I mean, it's a it's a technology that has been in place for other industries. It's kind of this molecular sieve, if you will. But when we do get to the um, the conversion of the lithium chloride solution, 
uh, the key here is is going to be electrolysis. I think the industry now converts the lithium chloride first into lithium carbonate, then into lithium hydroxide using a series of reagents. We are planning to go a different route, and that is just go electrolysis, uh, not chemicals. In other words, using electricity, not chemicals, to convert that lithium chloride into lithium hydroxide. There could be some opportunities there. And I do know that the membrane technology with electrolysis, I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable enough to go into detail, but if anybody wants more information, uh, Alex, I, I can certainly get that for folks. Okay. okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll weigh in because we've, we've been, um, we've been piloting, you know, our facility now for a number of years. Um, and, and we, if you think about, you know, a geothermal system broadly having three major unit operations. For us, that first one is is what is unique to the geothermal space, and that is this impurity removal step. Um, we we have gone back um, and have utilized uh, essentially prior art um, that was developed in the 80s um, and and run on you know Cal Energy brines way back in the day. And it is, it is nothing more than blunt force chemistry. Uh, it works great and it works reliably. Um, and it is what we need to protect, or, or should, should I say, you know, maintain the longevity of the adsorbent um, so that we can get multi-year performance out of an adsorbent and not have it foul with those, um, you know, interference elements that are kind of unique to geothermals. And that's typically the transition metals, and in our case, the, the high level of silica. So anything in that space that, you know, is is even incremental improvement is, is meaningful, right? Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a revolutionary technology. Incremental improvements at this point would be very welcome. I think you see a lot of, a lot of concerted effort not unique to geothermal brines, but the lithium industry as a whole as to how to take that lithium chloride and efficiently get it to the end use product. And that's, I think, you know, what Jonathan's pointing on, you know, there, there are chemical routes, there are, you know, uh, electro, uh, electrolysis routes, um, you know, what are, where the market is going is also a moving target, right? So you've got batteries that have historically been utilizing carbonate, that's moving to hydroxide. And if you read anything in the press, solid state is the next thing. Well, all of those have different precursors. They all have different um, lithium content specs that are going to be different. But maybe more importantly, they all have impurity levels that are going to be different. And that becomes a big, it's less about lithium content and more about all the other elements. Are you at parts per million? Are you at parts per billion in some of the, you know, um, contaminants in the final crystalline product? So. You know, a lot of work's being done there. So as I think about like a team that's working on geothermal, um, you know, uh, to me, the 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 focus is, you know, can you make can you make valuable co-product, whether that's manganese, whether that's zinc? I think I we might share uh, Jonathan's, you know, um, caution of, you know, whether potassium chloride is is worth going after. There's a lot of it, but it's it's one, it's it's not going to perform like potash plants that are world class today. You know, these are not, you know, they they have an advantage by virtue of that resource that we that we don't. So it, it may be economically un, un, or unsustainable, but, you know, there's. And the thing I laugh about, you know, we, we, we have around the office, you know, now we have periodic tables hanging on the wall, um, which is not normal for for power operations, but you know, it's everything in the periodic table is there except for like platinum metal group and gold, right? <laughs> so if, if you think you have a use for or a, a process that recovers anything of value um, and it's on the periodic table, chances are it's in the brine. Um, uh, but Dan has pointed out a couple of times, there's a couple of things we just soon keep in suspension and that's barium and strontium and, and things that ultimately add to a naturally occurring radioactive material mm -hmm. and, and and the power plants do a great job and, and our mineral um 
process to date, those stay in solution, and that's that's important. Um, so, you know, those are some competing um, issues there. But I think you know manganese, zinc, some of those metals. Um, if you look at batteries, I mean, that's part of that's part of the chemistry going forward. Um, and so, you know, I think it's 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 not always just lithium. It's potentially other things that could help the 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 lithium process be more efficient, but also could could create a viable co-product that maybe you know adds to. We talk about resiliency in a supply chain, but you talk about project resiliency. Eventually, we will see fluctuations in battery components, just like we see fluctuations. And even though these are not commodities, they are, you know, bespoke chemical um, products. Ultimately, we will see volatility there. And if a project has multiple products, um, you know, that's probably better for it in the long run. So. Great. I want to Thanks, add one Jerry. very quick yeah. point. Go ahead. One, other, one other possible area of research just to think about this is kind of writ large, less water use. Can you go into a little detail on that as far as what do you mean? Well, I mean, for example, the media that we use for the ion exchange, I mean, as Derek explained, I mean, you're, you know, when you're, I mean, we're going to be in parts per billion. We need, we've got, we've got to keep that, you know, as clean as we can before, you know, in between cycles, we need that water. But if there are ways generally to reduce overall water use, that might be of interest to folks looking at this prize. I mean, we still, you know, we're we're in the desert. We're going to use 90% less water than South America, but if we could even reduce that water use more, that would be beneficial, uh, at least for salt and sea lithium production. Okay, Derek, great. That yeah, that's fair, a good fair point, Derek. I'm, I'm maybe, maybe I'm off base there. I well, I think, I think in, in every input, I think geothermal brines have that advantage, but at the same time, I think it's important to continue to kind of push, um, you know, for a reduction, whether it's water use, energy yep. use, uh, you know, how to make these how to make these systems ultimately more efficient. Because, you know, today we sit and we feel like, you know, we've got a leg up uh, in all of those attributes, but, you know, we will be pushed um, further along as well. And then if you look at a research uh cycle plus commercialization you know we've got multiple years here before these things are you know a new idea is deployed um and again the competitive forces are such that i think if you can if you can go from 90 percent less to 95 percent less you know that's that's a big difference particularly as we go forward and and um you know we don't need to uh I guess highlight, you know, that the Western New York U.S. is, you know, in a severe drought and seems to be more common now than ever. So, all these issues are important. Yeah. And let's face yes, it, sir. if all we succeed in doing is producing lithium, <laughs> but not at a cost competitive uh, rate, we really haven't accomplished very much. I mean, we've got, you know, we've we've got to do this on a cost competitive basis with the rest of the world. And so I think it would be worthwhile for us to tell the um, the uh, potential uh, players in this game that that they're going to need to be able to work on this on live brine because of the instability of the of the brine. They're not going to be able to do it in a lab. You might start there, but I think it's got to. It, and, and I think both operators are having a pilot plant on their site. So I, th I think we need to emphasize that it's going to have to, at the end of the day the prize is going to have to be proven in a live on live brine a live brine yeah no it, it definitely sounds like it from our conversation here today that you know using some sort of synthetic brine is just not going to cut it is the sort of unique nature of the salt and sea and other geothermal brines so no thank thanks all for that um so we have a few minutes left for our call today. I just wanted to open it up to everybody and just ask if you had any sort of parting words for the teams, any any points that you want to really make clear as as these teams go forward in developing their their concepts. You know, I uh, started working at Salt Sea in 1984, and um, at that time for Unical, they wanted to break even on power production and make profit on mineral recovery. And I remember the 
we so we you know played with it pretty hard zinc mainly and i remember when we first sold our first railroad car to osarco uh, it was a zinc and uh, we just had a great office party <laughs> and you, you fast forward you know from there um, you know the talk with jonathan about that zinc recovery effort and you know i that the we've been trying that pilot test for for uh, lithium probably what 10 years Derek? something on that order so there's a lot of opportunity for us to bring research uh into some commercial phase um what that would be unique to uh you know the salt and sea brine and i think you know, when you look at it, like in the Europe plays, significantly less dense TDS, but also a, a much lower levels of, of lithium. And so that's probably the other part of the research is how do you recover either like either more lithium from a concentrated brine or lower levels of lithium, but more water that may be less in the TDS. So it, it's kind of a, the envelope of research, at least in that part. For me. Great. Yeah. No, thanks for that, Dan. I guess if I have any parting words, uh, just speaking for our company, I mean, if this were a baseball game, we're pretty much in the top of the first inning. I mean, we're starting. Um, and I think that's where uh, this prize can be quite effective. It's not as if, uh, you know, Derek referred to, to potash operations around the world that are so mature. I mean, this is not mature. We're starting. This is first of a kind. Uh, energy source is ahead of us in terms of getting that lithium out, but I think we're we're all interested. I mean, we are technology agnostic as a company. I mean, if there's a better mousetrap out there for any part of this process, uh, we want to look at that mousetrap. So um, we're, we're delighted to be part of this process. Great. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I was going to use the baseball analogy and apologies for those who, who aren't baseball fans, but I, I think it's appropriate. I think, you know, from our, my my parting thought is, you know, that any any technology, whether it, it it provides even just an incremental benefit, you know, hitting a lot of signal singles will get you around um, or get you around home plate. So, you know, the the technology doesn't have to be you know a, a revolutionary, game changing thing to be interesting and and adopted. Um, home runs may be fun and but they're hard to come by. And I think mm -hmm. you know. The, the universe should be looked at. And I think the challenges with geothermal, um, you know, have a lot to do with impurities. Um, and and that would be my focus, you know, if I was lobbying for one, but at the same time, you know, I can't appreciate all the potential cross-pollination that can happen, whether it's in the oil and gas space, whether it's in water treatment space, you name it, um, there are technologies that are transferable. And it's just a matter of having exposure and understanding, you know, the challenge. So, um, you know, I think it's um, I'd encourage the team to 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 participate, even if you think it's, you know, a, a modest improvement. It, it may be very meaningful at the end of the day. Yeah, no, thanks, Derek, for that. That's I think that's really important takeaway for for this prize overall. So. All right. Um, I think we've reached the end of our, our call today. I just wanted to thank you all again so much for participating today and, and providing such good conversation on um, background of, of geothermal and in the lithium extraction industry right now in the Salton Sea. And yeah, is there anything else that you wanted to add in today? Thanks, guys. It was really fun. Awesome. Actually. <laughs> okay. Thank <laughs> Great. you. Great. Thanks all right. Thanks, everyone. And for those of you, I hope that you all turn tune in next time for our next panel. Uh, we'll be talking to a new group of IAP members uh, discussing more of the technical aspects of lithium extraction. So thank you all. And I will talk to you all again. Bye. Thanks. Bye now.